Um, hey everyone, welcome to the Learn From Us podcast. This is Seth and Paul. And back by popular demand. Back by popular demand. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. This is a very monumental podcast for us, Paul. We made it to 100. Yes, we did, without being shut down. By I can't the quite figure that out. Yeah, like um, we've uh, we've had some bumps along the road. We've had some arguments, some good times, some bad times. But um, we've been to Mexico and back on multiple uh, continents. That's not a different continent. <laughs> <laughs> we've, but We're talking about Magic the Gathering. Back by popular demand, the most famous follower and guest of our podcast, John Dyer. John, welcome. How are you? I'm I'm very well. I'm honored to be here. Really? On this Thanksgiving Day airing of the 100th podcast. The, uh, yeah, the, I'm excited. The, now, the Buckeye game will be in a couple days here. Um, and John and I stand on the same side. That's right. Suck it. I didn't know. You guys are both Michigan fans. And so, um, much like every other year, you've had some squeakers this year. and um, But I, I obviously think the Buckeyes are going to win this year. But it's... it's um, we don't have to talk about that. And John, we have our ten-year reunion in uh, in two days. I just ordered tickets. I did too. Did you? Yeah. How nice. I actually thought to myself, I'm like, Seth's going to buy these at the last second. <laughs> Why would you think that? <laughs> because you tend to do that, but you did it. You saved 10, 10 bucks per wow. person. Boy, I, I got to get my character building up. <laughs> that, 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 I'm attack on character. But speaking of impeccable character, John, tell us about again <laughs> what company you own and what you do. Tell our new listeners why we're having you on here. No, I'm kidding. Who you are and what you're up to. So uh, my company is Nova Title Agency. We have offices in Solon and in Worcester, Ohio, and we cover all of Ohio. We do title work. So anybody that's buying, selling, or refinancing, we get involved. We make sure everybody gets what they need. So we make sure the sellers get their money, borrowers on a refinance get their money, that everyone has clear title in the transaction, and uh, we handle you know, multi-million dollar transactions all over the state. What's the biggest transaction you've ever done? We did a $54 million transaction earlier this year, a refinance, uh, seven counties, 17 properties. Oh, and, wow. And we got that because of the Gabriels, because of Crossroads Group, because of a contact that we met through Paul and Mike. Oh, I was not putting that as a plug for a pat in the back, no, by the way. Just, I, that's just a fact. I was not um, aware of that. Wow. Oh, wow. Good for us. So it's classic networking. Did, did your check come to us or no? <laughs> okay, we'll have to figure that out later. Yeah, I was going to say you supported us around here. <laughs> John supports the podcast Unlike any other viewer we have, Paul will mention like random things that he has to do in his life. And then John will text him like, hey, you know. <laughs> so the other night. <laughs> Tell me about this. Last week, it's 930 on the nose. We're on the Slack call for Dynasty Owner. And John goes, it's time for your call. I'm like, I'm on a call. He goes, yes, I know. I listen to your podcast. You have a 930 call tonight. I'm like, that's creepy. But not as creepy as what I did to John last night. Do you want to explain what I did to John last night? So. Paul and I were talking last night about the upcoming podcast, the monumental 100th airing of the podcast. And so we were talking, he was telling me about this dating app guy that's going to be a guest yes. in the future. So I was talking about this this thing in the New York or the well, Wall Street Journal. Or I don't know, it was some, something in the, it was a Sunday style section in the New York Times about this kid. He's 17 years old. He has like 10 million YouTube or like a million YouTube followers. And he acts like he's the girl or the boyfriend for girls. So he records these videos. He's like, Hey, honey, are you sleeping? Would you like some cocoa? Can I rub your back? And it like slowly gets people to go to bed and stuff. And it's a whole thing of YouTube. It's called AMSR, where these people like click bottles and they do these repetitive behaviors and they talk real soft. What are you? <laughs> it's a thing, man. AMSR? Yeah, yeah, look so, this up. so if you remember the Super Bowl last year, there was this ad with um, this this woman who's the daughter of Lenny Kravitz and Lisa Bonet. Yeah. And she's real attractive. She's in some show and she was clicking on a bottle and that was like the AMSR. That's what they do. They click stuff and make little repetitive noises in it for a lot of people. I'm not saying it's good or bad or whatever, but uh -huh. it's very soothing to them. So there's a whole host of YouTube people. And this kid is 17. He lives with his parents in Georgia. He's never had a girlfriend and he's probably making $50,000 a month on his YouTube videos. He gets three dollars per thousand viewers that he has, and he right. has like you know a million viewers. Subscribers or just views? You mean just views? I think views of each video he does. So it's it's a weird business, but it's a business. I mean, there's lots of things that I don't think are proper businesses, but they are. So, anyways, the reason we brought this up <laughs> is. My I, mind is blown at the so moment. So I said to John yesterday, we got off the call. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to send you one of these uh, audio things later. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, you do that. And he was like saying, like, like, don't do that or whatever it was. So last night at 930 or 9 o'clock or whatever, I record, 
Hey, John. <laughs> hope you're really enjoying your evening. <laughs> you know, I hope you're resting. And, they, and I said it right to him. <laughs> and it took you probably like half an hour, and then you responded. You're like, Do you listen to music to fall asleep? No, I just go right to I just, lights are off, everything off, boom, 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 done. What about you, John? Uh, no, I have, we have a noise machine in our bedroom that kind of takes me to sleep. I know Andrew listens to this Calm app or whatever. He oh, listens yeah, to like, like spiritual sounds. Andrew does? Yeah. Like Striegel. He, yeah, you can ask him. He, he Apparently, he puts them out in like five minutes. Does that sound like spiritual sounds something that Andrew would listen it's to? It's like nature I mean, and like oh. Enya shit. <laughs> but actually, Enya. if I'm napping, I listen, oddly enough, to like, um, you're not going to believe this, Paul. I mean, I, I might as well just say some of the craziest fucking thing. I, really, I listen to like Gregorian chant, like <laughs> re- religious Gregorian <laughs> chanting. Have you heard this, okay. John? I mean... There's a lot of weird people out there, Seth. <laughs> Something about, well, I think it's just, I naturally want to fall asleep in church. <laughs> so <laughs> Brings you back to it. So the singing just kind of puts me into, so I don't, yeah, so I don't enjoy church, but I li- enjoy listening to like Gregorian chants when I sleep. So so anyways. Go on. Back to John. John is an attorney. I am. I'm you an started attorney, as yeah. an attorney. Yeah, so I, uh, I got out of college and actually worked for a local real estate developer, Tony Asher at Weston Incorporated, for two years. And they own property all over Ohio and the Midwest and the, and the country at this point. And so I was an asset manager for them. Mm-hmm. I always knew I wanted to go to law school. Oh. And uh, so after doing that for two years, I did a year in Cleveland and then a year in Cincinnati. We opened an office in Cincinnati, and I opened that office for them. They had about 30 million square feet of real estate, um, two office buildings, and two office warehouse facilities. And uh, then I started law school in the fall of 1989 at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Full-time? Full-time, yeah. I did my first year as a full-time student, lived at home. Uh, Second year, I took a year off and traveled all over the world with a college buddy, actually. Really? Yep. Right before I left, I met my future wife, and who was up here in Cleveland training. Where was she from? She's from Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh. So she was working at Lincoln Electric uh, in a training program. So I kind of went through the fall, painted houses uh, to make money for my trip. I paid my way through a lot of college and law school by... Um, painting houses and doing stuff like that. My parents paid my tuition. I It was all my expenses and stuff like that. Um, so I did my second year law school uh, after that trip, which was an amazing trip. I was gone from October until May. And What uh, caused you to go on a trip one year after the first year of law school? Usually people do it in between. Yeah, I, I think I felt like that if I didn't do it then, I could never do it. And I had a buddy that was wanting to, my college roommate uh, was wanting to go to Southeast Asia and, and look for work there. He had worked at a shipping company called Maersk Clients, which is a huge shipping company uh, in New York City. And he had tried to get transferred to the Hong Kong office. It didn't work out. So he said, I'm just going to go to Hong Kong. That's where I want to live. Where does he live now? Um, he lives in Virginia, but he's lived oh. <laughs> in, no, he's lived in Southeast Asia for the last 30 years, probably 20, Seriously? 25 of those years. Yeah. Yep. Wow. And so we went, I mean, it was an amazing trip. We, I could tell you that could be the whole podcast, but I mean, just as an ex- a small example, we were in Egypt when the Gulf War started. So oh. before the war started, we're in Cairo. We get on a train that goes to Aswan. Aswan is in the Southern, uh, biggest city in the, in the country. And there's the Aswan High Dam, which is a couple hours from the town of Aswan. And that dam is heavily fortified because if that dam goes, the whole country will like wash into <laughs> the ocean because the size of the dam, it regulates the flow of the Nile. So it's critical for a lot of reasons uh, in that country because everything is within a mile of the Nile, essentially, in Egypt. Um, so it's a 24-hour train ride. There's like four people on the train bes- besides us. You'll go to an offshoot for three hours. For no reason. I mean, it's just no rhyme or reason to it. It's a third world country. We get to Aswan. We get off the train. Uh, we walk into the, you know, there's like a little town, I guess. And there's a tent and a TV. And Dick Cheney and Colin Powell are speaking in English about what just happened, like the first day of the first evening of the war. Um, and w- and they're speaking English for like five seconds and they start dubbing it in Arabic and we had no idea what was going on. Oh, like, yeah, because you can't did, hear it. Did we win? <laughs> did we lose? Are we good? Are we bad? So we, we went to the Nile and we're just sitting there. And I remember we're sitting on this bench. It's morning. We had something to eat. And this like random herd of goats just comes by and starts chewing up the grass. It was like perfect, weird third world moment. I mean, stuff like that happens in the third world. Do that? Um, mm. And so after a couple of days, we're like, we got to get out of this country because we have no idea what's going to happen here. And, and the travelers just were leaving 
uh, Egypt. So one of our last things we did, we took the train a couple of days later back up to Cairo. We're going to um, the Sphinx, which is in Cairo. Luxor is the bigger pyramids are in Luxor, which is a couple hours away. So we're in, in Cairo. And like, cab drivers would follow us down the street telling us, you know, papyrus, papyrus, trying to get us to come to their cousin's papyrus shop or that they'll take us someplace in their cab. Like they were desperate for foreign dollars. And we just said, we got to get out of here. So we, we flew on like a huge Airbus plane. There was like 12 people on this plane. And we went to uh, Kenya, to Nairobi. And we stayed there for three weeks. And the, by then, the war was kind of solidified because Egypt, you know, you're right there. You're right by the Middle East. So that was just part of the trip. Um, and your parents weren't like, no, you can't do this. Because because the Gulf War started in January, but it, but but he, 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 um, Saddam Hussein invaded um, Kuwait in August. Yeah. If yeah. you remember. So that, I mean, there was a build up there. It wasn't like you're, I mean, I don't know when you left on the trip. Well, we left, I left in October and I was in Europe. Um, until, oh, okay. you know, January, we went down into Greece and then over into to Egypt. And, we, you know, we didn't really know when anything was going to happen. And back then, you got to remember, there's like virtually no cell phones. I mean, there were some, I suppose, which we found in Hong Kong. And we were like walking down the street in Hong Kong. What a joke. What does that guy have a phone for? Like, who's he going to yeah. call? Like, doesn't he have a quarter? <laughs> like, what the, what's going on here? This is ridiculous. So that's how shows you how smart uh, mm. we were. Um, we would have to get mail. Uh, snail mail at an American Express office. That's how we would get stuff. And like, so there's one in uh, in Athens, Greece, and they, there was this big circular, like this big planter that was like 10 times the size of this table that was like tufted. So it was like a couch all the way around with all these plants in the middle. And like six months later, that office was bombed. And I later saw uh, a picture of the office, like where I sat there reading my mail. In it Athens? Been, yeah, in Athens, Greece, it had been bombed. So Wow. And, the, and the same thing with the American embassy in Nairobi. We would go. So when, when we were in Nairobi, um, every afternoon at the American embassy, you could go watch CNN. It would tell you what's going on with the war because they had TVs in the feed. So we would go there and, and you know watch that with other Americans just to see what was going on with the war. And that later got bombed. Um, so John, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> hey, luck follows me. What can I tell you? Taking so anyway, so you went on this trip, and I'm not trying to get back to career, but you know you're you're a you're a lawyer. You became a, so then you went to like the law school. Yeah, so I went I went to law school. I I worked for a small firm, my third year law school, uh, called Stafford and Associates, and it was a, a younger guy. He's four years older than me. Joe Stafford is a very well known divorce attorney. His younger brother was a year ahead of me in law school, Vince Stafford. So I clerked for them my third year. And I ended up working for them as I got out of law school. And so- As a divorce attorney? Yeah. So, well, as an attorney, we did mostly mm. domestic relations. So I got- That's what you did say that to me once. So I got sworn in on November 8th, 1993, the same day that Bernie Kosar was cut by the Cleveland Browns for diminishing skills. Mm. <laughs> so easy to remember. Day of infamy. Um, yes. So that was, a, that was a Monday or a Tuesday. I think it was a Monday. And that Thursday night, I was in a courtroom um, taking a deposition on a child custody case under wow. the watchful guise of my partner, Joe Stafford. Um, so I feel like I crammed about 20 years of practice into about six and a half years of practicing law. The way I describe my law practice was I spent two years figuring out what I was doing, two years getting good at it, and two years trying to figure something else out to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I ended up, during the course of my, uh, when I was practicing, I had a buddy, uh, Ron Such, who's a very successful mortgage guy, has a company called Union Capital Mortgage. I know Ron. Okay. So he was my partner in competitive title. So he would have legal issues relating to title and mortgages and things and deals couldn't close because of a problem or something. So he would call me, I'd come out and I was basically clearing title. I didn't really know what it was. I was just sending letters to people and talking to people and getting stuff done. And so I ended up doing that four or five times. And, and he said, Hey, let's set up a title agency. And I said, I'm a litigator, man. I don't know what that is. I don't even have a clue. Mm -hmm. um, and then it seemed like a good idea. Ron's very successful and it was good friend to me in a lot of ways. And so it still is. And uh, so I kind of figured out what title insurance was about as best I could and took the plunge in May of 2000. Uh, I left my law partnership. Uh, about, I gave him about a six month window. So I kind of petered out my cases and stuff like that. And in May of 2000, yep, we started uh, competitive title together. And we were in Beachwood and ran that company for 10 years. And it started out, we just did work for Union Capital Mortgage. And we slowly, um, because of all Ron's contacts and my contacts and our skills grew and we added staff and all that stuff, um, we built that business up. And after 10 years, I got an opportunity to come to Nova Title, uh, which is 
uh, affiliated with Reimer Law, which is a law firm that does debt collection work all over the state of Ohio. And they were do they have 15, 20 lawyers and I'm a lawyer. I wanted to get back into doing a little more legal stuff. So I ended up um, selling my interest back to Ron in about a five minute breakfast meeting. Was that back. tough? No, it was easy. So he was, so it wasn't <laughs> like he was upset going, what the heck are you doing leaving here? No, no, he's, he said, I want what's, what's best for you. You know, like you're my friend. I want you to be happy. And if this isn't working, then go do something else. And let's was it not working or you just had a better opportunity? Um, I had a better opportunity. It was just something that was more in line with what I wanted to do. Um, so it just kind of all worked out. And so did he know this, there were rumblings of it? Or it was just one of those things you like, Hey, guess what? No, I, th I, th I think we both knew, Really? you know, you, you get to a point where it's like, okay, are we going to be friends? Are we going to be business partners and kind of chafe at each other? So let's just, let's just move on and be friends. And Seth and I chafe with each other all the time. <laughs> I agree. Whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> is that when I met you when you were at the, um, in the, in the, uh, Benny Hanna building? Yeah, competitive title. Yeah, yeah that's okay, gotcha. Met. That's how I met him. That's how I remember it. It's Benny Hanna building. Benny Hanna. In Beachwood. It's still there. Yeah, so that, that was a nice landmark because you got to always tell people. Because for title, you know, if people can come to your office, it saves you a lot of hassle of going out. So we... Because if you forget something, you're like, oh, shit, I forgot this. Yeah, so I would say we affectionately refer to it as the Benny Hanna building, even though it's 2-3 uh. Chagrin, Chagrin East or something. Generic name like that. So tell me about Nova Tide. How many folks work there? And like, oh, it's a big little outfit. So there, we have yeah. uh, t 24 employees, and we have two sales reps, one in Worcester, one kind of in the greater Cleveland area. Um, we have three attorneys, myself, and two other attorneys, uh, Catherine Brown and Chris Flowers. We have I think, six licensed title agents, which is pretty unusual for a title agency to have that many licensed title agents. We've incented people to get their title agents license, so you've got to go through background checks and pass a test and all of that, and then be appointed by an underwriter. Uh, we're agents of three large underwriters, Fidelity, National Financial, uh, Old Republic, and First American Title, which are the three biggest title insurance underwriters. So uh, we get in front of as many people as we can to do all kinds of transactions, whether it's commercial, res residential. Um, we do a lot of investor work. So people that are buying single family residences around Northeastern Ohio and the rest of the state, we work with them. And what ends up happening uh, is we get into a rhythm, you know, we start to click, we get to know each other, we get to be friends. It's exactly what happened with, oh, with yeah, Paul well, and Mike with Crossroads Group. So we slowly just got to know each other and then they would send us deals and we'd take care of them. And, you know, <clears throat> after a little while, they're, they're our friends. We want to take care of them, make sure everybody has a good experience. And then we meet new people. So like the large transaction we did came from a lawyer that I met through Mike and Paul, who's now a good friend of mine. And, you know, we, or business to each other and this and that. So that's just kind of how the world works. So, you know, you take care of people and uh, you'll do okay. What are some of the big deals that you two have done together? You know, Paul, we, Paul, will you turn that mic into your... Into I'm your sorry. We, I was here. I was adjusting his and mine needs adjustment. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, you've done a lot of refinances for us. Uh, mm -hmm. The Shaker one was a big refinance. Yep. We that did was that years a couple ago. times. Uh, the, the property down in Columbus, we did a couple. We just did a couple, the, yeah, done a couple of refinances there. We're going to do another one here next year for the okay. other property in Columbus. Uh, whenever we can, usually who picks the title? Usually it's the buyer, picks the, title. the buyer or the refinancer, sir. Yeah, generally it's it. the buyer selects title. So you, you, when we're buying a property, which we haven't done in a while, we're always like, hey, we're going to use Nova. <clears throat> whenever we're selling a property, we suggest Nova, but at the same point, I don't blame a buyer to say, no, I'm picking because it protects me. And we get that. We do the same thing. So um, yeah, we do all of, our, all of our stuff with John. I, I don't think there's been a, a deal that if we're allowed to pick, we don't pick John. Do we? No, I don't think so. But yeah, John's I mean, also been helpful in a lot of other things. Like we just call him and say, hey, can you pull title on this? Can you do a search for this? And he does that for us. How do you grow uh, this title? How have you guys grown this title business over the past, how long has it been, eight years? Uh, yeah, so I've been at Nova for 10 years. So it's, it's, really, it's really deal by deal, person by person. So like just as an example, on my way here today, I got a call from someone that works for a new client, somebody that I met earlier this year at a networking event that I sponsored with a local lender, a hard money lender called Fund That Flip, which is in downtown Cleveland oh, yeah. and in New York City. <clears throat> so we met some people there. We've probably done a half dozen to a dozen deals with them. Are they pretty easy? But yeah. Yeah, they're excellent. They're excellent. Um, you might want to consider that. Good doing fund my flip? Fund, fund that flip. Yeah, good uh, folks to work with. So Casey Marks is their sales manager, and John Andrews is a local head. I just ran into him yesterday in downtown Cleveland. Um, so, because I was working on one of their files, so I got to see him. So, of course, I pulled the car over to make sure he knew that I was personally deal <laughs> dealing with this file. So, little things like that, but also, 
you help people. So on my way here, um, I got a call from somebody that works at this new client and he's got a personal issue with a septic system and the potential need for an easement. And I've just been, I'm doing a three hour continuing ed class in uh, Worcester tomorrow, just as an example, and easements are something I'm talking about and prescriptive easements where the court will construe an easement where one doesn't exist based on a set of facts. So it's a way that you can lose property or gain property based on people's conduct relative to an issue. In this case, it's a septic system. The one I'm teaching about tomorrow is a water line. So, uh, you know, so you spend 20 minutes on the phone with somebody, explain to him the ins and outs of what he's looking at doing, maybe the best way to handle it. I said, look, you could win this case, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. You might want to think about just building your own septic system that's going to be totally bulletproof and not sharing one with your neighbor. That's kind of hinky. And if the Summit County Health Department comes around, I doubt they're going to approve that. So, you know, you, you don't want to f- fight a court battle, win or lose, and then have the health department come in and tell you that you've got to redo the septic system regardless of whatever you did in a court um, situation. So, and, and, you know, sometimes it's little things. Like yesterday, a client called me. There's a, a change in pricing in certain aspects of what we do for lenders on refinances. And about 50% of this bank's title agents are saying, we need to do a survey to delete this certain coverage. The other 50% are saying we don't. So the difference is about $175 to the consumer. The banks don't want to be a more high cost uh, provider of services because that'll cause someone to go from one bank to another, especially if you're competing at the, at a certain price point. Of course. And so they lose their comparative advantage. So I talked to the, the loan officer, um, sales manager, a friend of mine who I've known for 15 years and done a zillion deals with. Uh, connected me with their person that's in charge of this vendor relationship and I explained to her what's going on, uh, made sure she had all the information from the state, said, look, if you have any issues or pushback from the title agents, just call me. I'll tell you who the state agency manager is for each of the underwriters and you can push back with them and get clarity. It's not that the agents are, are wrong. I just don't think that they really understood. To me, the answer is very clear. Other agents have the right to make their own underwriting decisions, but... Because it's on them on the hook, right? Yes, but... You know, it doesn't make sense to charge for something that you don't need to charge for. I I could go through the gory details. It's too boring for most people. But um, in general, I I just try to set the person straight or at least give them the tools that they need to to take the next step um, to push back a little bit on the title agency or, of course, to send all their business to Nova Title, which is what we advocate for. And so what what we found is if you end up helping people, whether it's our transaction or not, you end up getting business. And I mean, I, I got stories like that. One of my best customers right now. Um, I, she was, she wasn't doing a ton of work at the time. She had a transaction with, uh, that was in Shaker Heights. The, how did this work? The, the title company was, the loan was through Quicken Loans. Uh, the title company was whatever their title company was called at the time from Michigan. Um, the day before the closing was supposed to happen, the title company in Michigan said, well, you need to deposit the seller documents in escrow. And our escrow officer will be in Cleveland tomorrow. So this is like four o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday. So the, t- the realtor went to our manager and said that the title company in Michigan said, I have to deposit all the seller documents in escrow. What am I supposed to do? And they didn't know what to do. So they called me because I'm the answer guy, luckily for me, uh, for them. So I said, look, send me the documents. They sent me the package. Uh, it was like 25 pages. I printed them out. I called the person. I called the seller. I went to their house in Beechwood seven o'clock at night, signed them, dropped the papers off the next morning at the realtor's office just as a favor to them. And then, and so figured my part's done. The next day, the realtor dropped all the papers off with the escrow officer who signed up the buyer. And then the escrow officer went to downtown Cleveland to file the deal. So all good. About three o'clock, I get a phone call from the realtor thinking she's going to congratulate me. Thank you so much. You saved my bacon. She says, the guy from Michigan has a check and it's off by $8 and they won't take cash and they won't like, they won't do a <laughs> discount. We can't close this deal. What are, it's Friday. What are we going to do? So I said, all right, let's hold on. Let me call you back. So I called, our, called Paul and asked if you could borrow the money. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> yeah. Did I tell you this before? No, no, keep going. No, 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 it's a different story. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
So we have a guy that did our filings in downtown Cleveland, and he always is holding a couple of our checks just in case something weird happens. He's caught short. Oh. And so I, I said to him, I'm like, hey, John, there's this guy from Michigan. He's probably beat red. He's really frustrated in the recorder's office. Just go find him and give him our check and walk him through the process, and don't worry, he'll pay us back. So I don't know, it was probably eight, 800000 bucks, whatever. Oh, okay. So yeah, I was going to say, we, I'm like, damn, how much are you fronting here? Yeah, not, not a ton. It's $4 per thousand to transfer a property. It's probably a couple hundred thousand dollar property. So he ended up helping them file, and then Quicken's title company sent us a check you know, the next day or whatever it was. So then we, we were like, we went from just helpful to being super helpful. And I mean, from then on, that lady used me, that realtor used me. Um, until she joined an affiliated business arrangement. So in Northeastern oh, yeah. Ohio, it's not unusual for a real estate agent to own part of a title company. So there's kind of mm. two types of title companies. There's the types that are called, referred to as ABAs or affiliated business arrangement title companies where 50, 51% of the company is owned or some percentage more than 50% is owned by the, the um, people that own the title company. And then they reach out to realtors and the realtors all own a small percentage that stack up to 40, up to 49%. So it's pretty typical for a large, a big hitter realtor to own part of a title company. And so they're incented to send business to that title company. So that hurts somebody like me that doesn't have any realtor partners because of, of a hundred realtors out there, 45% of them or whatever the percentage is, I don't even know, have a, a, ownership in a title agency. So they're incented to send business to that title mm -hmm. company because they get a bigger check at the end of the year, right? Or at the end of the quarter. So we have fewer potential clients, but if people don't want to, if people don't want to be affiliated with a title company for a variety of reasons, you know, we're hopefully a good option. And so this woman was with me, used me all the time. And then she went to the ABA, um, you know, and then she didn't get the service she likes. So now she's back with us and it might flip flop like that back and forth. I mean, I have realtors that are good friends. I've done a ton of deals with that are part of an affiliated business arrangement because they just, you know, they, they want the money. They want the extra X dollars per year. Seth, you have something? Well, I tend to marvel at folks like John, uh, obviously older than me, obviously. Um, incredibly intelligent and with it. I wonder like what, what, what challenges in life have you overcome personally to get to this state? Totally switching topics, but like, like, yeah, I'm just wondering how you got to be this awesome. Well, I don't know how awesome I am. I've been very lucky in my life, so I can't really say I've had any huge challenges. I mean, my parents were very helpful to me and educated me. Um, he went to school with Jason Garrett, the, the Dallas Cowboys coach. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I, I always to, say that. Hmm. Uh, I grew up in Cleveland. I went to high school at University School, which is an excellent school. Uh, I went to Middlebury College, which is, a, which is also an excellent college. I went there, so of course I'm going to say that, but sure. it's, it's a well-known college. Harvard of the Midwest, I assume. Small. Like it's out east, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's in, it's in Vermont. <laughs> Sorry. It's, you know, it's, every it's college. Harvard, it's the Harvard of the East. Every college says that. They're the Harvard of the, yeah, yeah keep this going. This is the Harvard down. of the East. I sort of say the same thing. Like, I haven't really... Harvard. I know where Harvard is. It's it's the Harvard of <laughs> Northern Harvard, Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the second Harvard of the East. Yeah. Um, I, I I haven't had, I haven't had that incredible incredibly difficult of a life myself. I guess my dad passed away rather early, so I've missed sort of that fatherly help, you know. But I'm kind of like you. I mean, I cut you off. Like, I mean, like, is your mother still around? Yeah, my mom and dad are still still alive. Yep. Yeah. I might, you know, so my dad was in real estate. He was in commercial real estate as a mortgage guy. So um, when I was a little kid, we moved around a lot. So I think I went to seven elementary schools in six years, one of them twice, which is kind of odd, but it was, it was good because I moved around a lot. It was much harder. I have four sisters. It was harder on my older sisters because mm -hmm. it was went more when they were in junior high and high school yeah. where we're switching schools all the time. Um, so we lived in Cleveland, uh, Detroit. Shingle Springs, California, Sac Shingle Springs, Sacramento, California, Columbus, and then back to Shaker Heights. So wow. we moved around a lot. Um, but I mean, I've been, I've been very fortunate in a lot of different ways. Tell me about your kids. So I have three kids. Our oldest is 22. She is a sales associate at Groupon in Chicago. She just graduated from Miami of Ohio. Cool. And uh, we're going to see her this weekend, actually. Married um, or no? She's not married. She's just 22. 22, so. got it. I was married at 22, John. So. Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> yes, he was. Yeah. It's impressive. I'm going on 16 years, and I'm 38 years old. Wow. So. 
Anyway, keep going. Tell me what your um, kids. Our middle daughter is. A, she actually goes to the college I went to. She's a junior at Middlebury College. She's currently in Buenos Aires, Argentina, doing a semester abroad. Argentina. Argentina near Barcelona. <laughs> Barcelona. <laughs> so she's uh, she's doing great. She's actually one of the parts of the um, of the course of uh, study is she's working at a nonprofit that does human rights litigation in Argentina. So she, they, she's gotten a, a lot out of that. It's been very interesting to her. And uh, so they, they do a lot of legal work. So that's been fun for her. We're actually going to go down there at Christmas time to go visit her. And oh, then wow. she's going to come back. And our son is a freshman at Miami of Ohio. He was the uh, field goal kicker for Cleveland Heights. He was. Uh, where Travis Kelsey went to high oh, okay. school. And Jason Kelsey. And Jason Kelsey. He yes. actually kicked his first. He they, they let him do two field goals. He made them both. The first one was a 38-yarder against Walsh last fall. That's right. Wow. I remember you taking the video and putting it on Facebook. Yeah. And I, I Cleveland Heights beat Walsh a couple weeks ago, but Walsh acquitted themselves well. They played well. It was 38-30. They, they played a good We're, game. Uh, well, we can't get much worse than we have been the last few years. Yeah. No, they, they played well. I was impressed. So, um, looking forward with Nova Tida, how, how, where is that place? Well, first go? off, go Paul. John and I cannot disclose it, but we're working on a patent together right now. We are. John at our family golf outing. I assume it's for sex toys. Yes, it is. John and I have to try these things out. John came up to me and goes, why, Paul, why, I Seth? Have to- <laughs> I just say this shit because Tim's yeah. over here. <laughs> Tim, 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 I, I don't think Tim wants to hear that. <laughs> exactly. Actually. That's the point. <laughs> I just look right at him like, no excuses. What, what the podcast has come to. Go ahead. He comes to me and goes, Paul, I have a great business idea. You, like, did, you signed an NDA, I assume. I did not. Exactly. Okay. And he told me the idea, and I'm like, that is a really great idea. Come on. We can't disclose it, unfortunately. You won't even tell me as a dear friend? I, I cannot. I'll I, sign an NDA, okay, whatever we'll that means. Okay, we'll have sign an NDA, we'll tell you. I think you'll appreciate this, this idea. It's a very simple idea, but it's awesome. And uh, it, so we're working on with a patent attorney, and yep. your friend Gus, is that his name? Yeah, yeah, Gus Shermack. So it's funny, I'm going to be partners with a guy I have no idea what his name is, and uh, we need to get a phone call at some point yep. and decide our next steps. But uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Like, John came up to me, I'm like, that's a good idea. Like, that's a really good idea. And I told my brother, he's like, I don't get it. I'm like, okay, you're an idiot. Next. Is it, it software-based or is it? It's a- everything is software these right? days. Yeah, I was going to say. It's sporting related. It's sporting event related. Ah, got it. To so make the experience a lot more exciting. So yeah. anyways, that's what John and I are going to be working on soon. Interesting. Yeah. I'm glad you told me. <laughs> now I have not to worry about it. Um, After Nova Title. Because, John, you're what, mid-50s? Yeah, I'm 55. So, um, you exactly. You know, I, I, the future for Nova is, I, it's unlimited. I mean, it's just whatever we want to do. And so, it's they sell that a good we, multiples. Like, if you ten years from now, you're like, okay, we built this thing up. Now I want to retire. Do they sell at good multiples? If I'm selling or buying, if I'm buying, it's two to three. If I'm selling, it's five to seven. No, so I mean, three to four is kind of the typical multiple of uh, you know net profit is what you'll get on a title insurance agency. Oh, interesting. You know, the issue is always is, and one thing that I've it's been a big challenge for me is making making it about Nova Title, not about me personally, because we we have to function without me being involved in the day to day, and that's something that I've learned a lot from Paul in mm-hmm. listening to the podcast. You actually learn a lot, which if people don't know that they should listen because Thank you, you do learn a lot. But I'm sure Thank you knew that ahead of time, though. Yeah, but sometimes it's good to hear it kind of outside of your normal day to day because what happens with me is you know you get on that hamster wheel and you're going yeah. through your day and you're doing all your stuff and you realize, hey, look. If I'm all involved in these files, that's not good for anybody. The first thing is when I get involved in the files, they get all messed up because we have a process and we have a system. And if I kind of get involved in that, that's not the normal process. Yeah. So it makes it complicated. That's the first thing. So it has the exact opposite effect <laughs> that I want it to have. Number one. And number two, one thing I've, I've slowly learned, it's taken me a long time, is it can't just be about me. It's got to be about the company as a whole. And that's a hard thing to do. It is. And so the one thing we're really working to develop is a client acquisition strategy that will allow us to go into virtually any market in the state and get business. And so um, there's things that we're doing to put that in place. And, um, you know, the, the, the main thing I'm focusing on right now, there's the interest rates have dropped. So there's a lot of people doing refinancing. So we're connecting and reconnecting with people that we've um, done business with in the past and that maybe we have some connection with or if we catch them on a transaction so we're closing 150 some odd deals a month so we come across a lot wow. of different people so there are a lot of realtors that i have the ability to call and say hey, hey frank we're working on the sale of 123 johnson street thank you for sending us that deal um you know let me know if you need anything here's my cell phone number so just doing those little things 
And I find the more I give out my cell phone number, the few, fewer people call me because people are like, okay, I don't need to call that guy. There's the, here's the escrow officer. Here's the escrow assistant, the escrow manager. There's plenty of people to communicate with. Mm-hmm. Um, but people appreciate knowing that, you know, we took the time to reach out to them to give that information. And um, so that's been a good way for us to, to build our clientele. I just called John. What have you loved about the podcast and how can we improve? <laughs> Just the, the banter, I really like. The, the, it is the, good banter. The things that kind of happen time and time again. Um, the, the, the say, the, the fact Isn't that- Isn't Seth a great host? And I'm not just saying that because he's here. Like, I, I, if I was just me doing it, I'd be like, okay, but Seth is like- Well, Seth is a great host. I, I will tell you, I don't know if you guys know this, but there are various chat rooms about the podcast. And one of them has got chemists involved because Seth has a PhD yeah. in chemistry. So the first time I met Seth- before we started, I was like, I feel like I know all this stuff exactly. about you. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's, there's rumor out there that your dissertation was not on the thermonuclear effects at zero gravity of a flux capacitor. Oh, but <laughs> that, that, it, that, it, that it was actually about, it was titled our friend, the beaver. Is is that true? What, what, it, what is going on this here? This is news to me. <laughs> what is going on our here? Fr- our that, friend, the beaver. That's being discussed out there. That it's a whole fraud. This whole chemistry thing. It's really not. Have I seen this PhD? Accurate. That's a good question. I've never actually seen this PhD. I. Um, Where is it? I did not walk, to per se, like at oh. graduation. Oh. See, cheek in the armor. <laughs> oh. This was a salty point for my wife. She wanted the. She wanted the, the theatrics. No, no, no pun intended. The pomp and circumstance of uh, graduating with the hat and the robe and all this. And I, I don't know what it was. I was busy that that weekend. And so, but I do have my thesis and everything. I can, I can show yeah, everyone. Yeah, I want to see so. that. For that to me, John just pulled out another list. The last time he pulled out a list, it was the Paul. Here are the things you say that are incorrect. So what's this list now? So, so the so the one thing I wanted to say. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Tim's excited. No, no, this isn't any kind of a dig. Oh, okay. damn. Okay. So the other day, I was listening to the podcast. Uh-huh. And this is just, this will give you a little bit how my mind works, I okay. guess, for lack of a better way to describe it. I'm listening to the podcast. I'm on the way home. Paul is talking about going to London, going to a Michelin starred restaurant. <laughs> Three star. Three star. <laughs> Which, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense that a company that sells tires also rates restaurants. <laughs> yeah. It's like an obvious collaboration. So, by the way, was the podcast before Went to London or after? No, it was after. Okay, good. Because so I was already complaining. So, yes. Paul's, <laughs> Paul's talking about going to this Gordon Ramsay restaurant and how he's just mocking the whole experience. And just his brother, Mikey, is just doing a slow burn because he's just, just yeah. polluting the whole slow atmosphere. Slow burn. He hated it. So... All I could think of is, and I think there was a Flintstones episode where Fred Flintstone <laughs> goes to some French restaurant and he asks for ketchup and the chef gets super mad. And I could just think of Paul ordering ketchup for a steak, Gordon Ramsay coming out, getting in a fight with Paul, and then Paul suing him. And the judge, of course, would be a fan of Seinfeld. So he'd make Gordon Ramsay be Paul's chef. For like a year. And I get all these potato and then, chips. And then, and then Crossroads Entertainment would film it as a reality show, and Paul would end up being president. <laughs> that would be awesome. The Mind. president would be incredible, wouldn't so it? So I just, like, that's how I processed it. But then, were you born in this country? No, I was not. I was not I'm not allowed to be president. So that you see, so that I, I was the, born in that country that you were when you were in Egypt. If you guys go back, it's like podcast. It's like number eighty one, two or three. Um, I don't know what the title is, but it's back in October. And um, dude, I called Paul after that podcast was released because I was crying in laughter myself at how freaking funny it was hearing Paul go to this uh, this amazing restaurant. So the reason it's funny also is because like look at John. You should have seen John at our Christmas party. John's a very like I tell him he looks like the professor, the liberal professor. <laughs> Even though he's not a lib. Does he wear the glass? The oh, glasses? Oh, one thousand percent. You yeah. do? Somewhere. Where are they? I don't know. They're over oh, there. No, no, he has no. It's he has he has glasses that are more round than this. Oh, way okay. more round. I see. But it's funny because I'm snobby about so many things yeah. that, except for food. So I'm going to this thing, and you like nice food, don't you? Like sure. you're, you're a foodie. I, I'm not. We talk about this a thousand yeah. times, and it's just oh, the Michelin star fiasco. And I was hoping people would appreciate it, not say like this guy's being a prick, like not appreciating the fact that he's at this restaurant. John, when you put those glasses on, you look like, who's Ferris Bueller's friend? You, you've gotten <laughs> that does. before, right? Yeah. Somebody somebody recently said that to me. Yeah. And I can't remember. Cameron? Is Cameron. Cameron, name? yeah. And um, Was he the same guy in Spin City? Never saw it. Yeah. Was it the same guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like yeah you do assistant. look like him, I think. <laughs> He's you on have a, the same sort of show called. You have Succession. the same sort of Say, vocal when tone Moses too. Moses was in Egypt. <laughs> Cameron was. 
Wasn't that what he's saying? I, there? Didn't, I, I, I didn't know you've been all over the world like that. That's incredible. Your travels. Yeah, it was a, it was a great trip. Um, have you been to Mexico? I have been to Mexico. Have you been I've, to our house in Mexico? I've no. not. I've not. One of one of the most amazing things on my trip um, was seeing the Taj Mahal. Because as a kid, you know, you're you're so like that's just one of those things that you hear about and you read yeah. about and stuff like that. And so they say that the one thing in India that really works well is the train from uh, Delhi to Agra. So you have to take this train. And then as we were, we took, they have these little taxi type things called tuk-tuks. It's like a motorbike with kind of a couple seats in the back. So you're driving up there. And I was just, it's hard to describe the feeling. It's like this incredible anticipation of being able to see the Taj Mahal. And it was, it was everything that I thought it would be. And is it it's in the really middle of amazing. like this big field? It's just like... Well, it's kind of, it's kind of, th there's a big wide river that rolls around. And so on a bluff above the Taj Mahal is the Red Fort. And this guy, Shah Jahan, built um, the Red Fort and he built the Taj Mahal for himself. And it's white. And then there was supposed to be a black one next door. And it was, it was they, it's a mausoleum for him and his wife. And so then Shah Jahan's son ended up... Um, kind of deposing him and putting him in the Red Fort as a jail. So he spent his last dying wow. days looking on the Taj Mahal that he built a as dick. a mausoleum for him and his wife. The son did that. So it's it's quite a story. Um, what year was this? Uh, boy, I don't know. I don't know when the Taj Mahal was built. 15, huh? 14, 15. Do you think you'll ever like go? That. Yeah, I have friends in India. And, you know, we're starting to do business with people in India. So we've talked about going out there and... Uh, and seeing it. I mean, we do a lot of business with India. We have our dev team, and then we have um, a lot of uh, things we're starting to manufacture out there in India. Have you been to Machu Picchu? I have not been there. I want to go there. Yeah, there's... Pretty bad. Th there's... Someone is saying that they should build an airport up there, which will completely destroy it. So, well, you know... that's the point. Like, you, how can you do yeah. that? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's... So, when we were in Kenya, as an example, uh, we, we climbed Mount Kenya, which is a 17,000... Foot peak. Now it's a walk. You just walk up it. Some people get altitude sickness. Some people didn't. We didn't have a problem with it. But we were joking. This one guy said we were at the top, and you know it's pretty tight at the very top. It's not technical at all, so you can just kind of walk up. But still, um, this guy said, "Yeah, you know, when my kids come here, there'll be an escalator to take you up." And I'm sure it's not that, but you know, that's that's what happens. Things change, and you know, I mean, that was 1990, right? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it is pretty nuts, but yeah. Either way, the traveling, uh, you don't travel, do you travel a lot now? Yeah, we do. Um, yeah. yeah, my my family and I, my kids and I, and my wife have traveled quite a bit. We went to, so the, we went to Zimbabwe on a safari in oh, South wow. Africa. I went uh, shark cage diving. That was like in 2014 or 2000, yeah, 14. And then we went to Morocco um, with two of our kids, two of our three kids, and spent three nights on the Sahara uh, you riding like camels. The, you, you don't like the other one, the other kid? You're like, you're going to stay home. Yeah, she was bad, so she had to stay home. <laughs> you gotta stay um, home. No, what, are you, what are you looking forward to with your kids over the next five, ten? Um, th just watching them grow and evolve. It'll be very interesting to see what our middle daughter does. Um, as she, you know, she's three and a half years through college this fall or this uh, winter, so she's got a year and a half left. So it'll be interesting to see where she lands. Um, and just watching our son go through the college experience will be a lot of fun. Our oldest is living in Chicago. She's got an apartment with a couple roommates, so she's kind of set there for at least the next little bit. So it's a, uh, it's very gratifying and very fun to watch your kids grow and, um, you know, become people that you can be proud of. And that's something that my wife and I have enjoyed doing. Yeah, me too. Well, John, his um, kids, you've enjoyed watching his kids grow. Yeah. They're on Facebook. Haven't you seen? <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Paul. Get with the times, man. I don't think John, by the way, speaking of in social media, he doesn't have a profile picture for Instagram. I, do, I, Everything I do on social media, I like. I always do the wrong thing. I friend the, the wrong person. I just I don't know how to do anything technological. I got a camera over here. I can take a couple quick pics of you I, there. I'm good with what I got, man. Great. The good thing about my Instagram is that the only people see it are close personal friends. So, oh, you know, I can put anything on there I because most people <laughs> don't care. Well, thank you for joining us for episode 100. Um, I don't think we could have thought of another super fan to have on and supporter. Should uh, we have him on for every 100 episodes or maybe the 1,000 for the next one? I think every 100 episodes we should have John Every 100. On. I, I, can I make a suggestion? Go ahead. Please. I, I think for either the 150th or 200th episode, I think Seth the Roof in Columbus should be the guest. <laughs> <laughs> I had this idea. 
We'll, we'll, we'll work to that, John. I think, yeah. Because we, I think we can make that happen. I feel like yeah. I understand get him on what the phone. your roof has gone through. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, if you go back to this podcast, I, I don't really, even know when that was. Like, podcast in the 50s. I was in an insurance battle with a roof. Whatever uh, happened with that? You got it, a check? It, it was an ongoing saga. I mean, yeah. It wasn't just yeah. one episode. Yeah, I got a check, and uh, then, yeah, long story. Let's not talk. There's probably some... Some bad things to talk about with that, like probably have some legal, yeah, probably NDAs so. you sign, yeah, I repercussions. Yeah, yeah. You're signing NDAs, but anyway, John, thanks for coming on. It's nice to hear from you. Um, I'm sad that we couldn't bust up Paul. It's some something very satisfying about busting up <laughs> his. Uh, you know, the same thing happened last night. One of my group chats. Somebody said to me, "Well, if Paul doesn't like it. We all can't like it." But I'm just like, "Oh, you're an idiot. I don't like you. We all can't like you anymore." So that was that. <laughs> I should add you guys to that group chat. Thanks for, uh, thanks for following the podcast, as always. If you want business help, contact Paul. If you want title help, contact John. Nova Title. NovaTitle.com. Uh, Nova, NovaTitleAgency.com. NovaTitleAgency.com. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Learn from us. Love you. Bye. Thanks, Bye-bye. John.